Hi everyone, uh, my name is William. Uh, this talk is CUDA in your Python. Uh, so I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about how we can start uh, programming on the GPU from the safety of our Python program in the language we're familiar with. Um, so I wanna start off with some bad news. Moore's Law is dead. Um, this is kind of a tough one. So Moore's Law, what was it? Basically an idea that the number of transistors that you can fit on an integrated circuit would double every two years. Initially it was every one year actually. He had to revise that. Um, and this is Gordon Moore, namesake of the law. Uh, and so he based it on this data. So you can see this graph. Uh, on the left side it's a log scale. So the linear nature of it says that it's doubling. Um, and you can see this held from like uh, the 50s, 60s, 70s. This actually went up all the way till the 2016. With, this is with some like actual data. And so you can see that relationship pretty much holds true. I mean, it's doubling and doubling up until 2016. Um, but honestly, we're starting to hit a plateau. A lot of people like to write about it. There's a lot of headlines popping up. What are we doing now? Moore's Law is dead, all these things. Um, and, and, and you know, you might ask, is, is this really true? Um, and I'll say, I trust this guy. This guy says, I guess I see Moore's Law dying here in the next decade or so but that's not surprising. Uh, and who, who is this guy? This is Gordon Moore. He said that in 2015. So if he said it, <laughs> I think we can start to buy into this idea that at least over the next, I mean, he said it in 2015. So over the next five years, we're gonna start to see a plateau uh, in you know, getting more and more transistors onto these chips. And so this leads us to the question, why I'm up here talking to you about GPUs and, and how can they help us uh, kind of combat this problem that we're facing. Um, so a little bit about the history of the GPU. It's a graphics processing unit. Uh, it was originally developed for gaming uses. The typical wor workload involves a lot of arithmetic on like a lot of pixels, you might imagine, or a lot of objects that are in a frame to do rendering and shading. Uh, and it's specialized for matrix operations because if you can imagine a representation of a scene in a game, could be a matrix, a 2D matrix of pixels, or even a 3D matrix, and then you're performing some transformations on them, uh, operations like that. So that's kind of the background of why did people start manufacturing these devices in the first place. Uh, and so to start to understand even more the differences and how we might get some benefit from computation on the GPU, we can look at the specs. And these are two uh, kind of top tier consumer grade GPU versus CPU. So uh, on one side, we have NVIDIA's 2080 Ti, which came out pretty recently. Uh, and then on the other side, this is uh, Intel's i9 9900K. Uh, um, so this is what they are. We can look at the specs. And so on the one hand, you can see the GPU has a ton more cores and even, even more like processors. So that's over 4,000 CUDA cores uh, across 68 streaming multiprocessors versus the Intel CPU has eight. It can get up to 16 hyper threads, um, but that still is, is very small in comparison to the GPU. Um, but on the other hand, you look at the base clock and the boost clock, and you can see that the CPU in terms of the clock speed is achieving up to three times uh, better uh, performance than the GPU. Um, so if we look at this diagram of the architecture, we, we can start to understand kind of why these things are the way they are and how the GPU can start to help us with certain workloads. Uh, so basically, you have the CPU architecture. You can see a large amount of it is uh, related to control and caching. So these are two important pieces of how a CPU operates. You want it to interpret your if statements, your while loops, and also to be able to cache uh, memory close to it so it doesn't have to go into RAM. Uh, and you can see relatively fewer of the transistors are allocated to arithmetic units, um, which is the green. Uh, in the GPU diagram, you can see uh, relatively little of the transistors are dedicated to control and caching, and so more and more can be dedicated to arithmetic operations, which is why for simple arithmetic operations that don't involve a lot of control flow, uh, the GPU can end up running a lot faster. Uh, and so, Kind of all those factors um, have led to the rise of what you call GPGPU, uh, which is the idea that we can do general purpose computing on a GPU and not just use it 
for specialized purposes like video games graphics. Uh, and so this quote is from a paper published by NVIDIA in 2014 and basically was saying that, that in the past we thought these devices are only good for, for gaming, for graphics, but now we can start to think of them as parallel processors, which is what they really are. And a bunch of the GPU companies started making their own kind of models of how to program these things. So CUDA, which is what I'm going to talk about today, was developed by NVIDIA, um, but also AMD had App, and OpenCL is kind of a growing open standard. Uh, and so these are different ways people are coming up with how we can turn this device that we have that has certain desirable properties uh, into something that we can run general purpose workloads on. Um, and so this kind of gets into, well, why am I interested in this? How did I come to be giving this talk up here? Uh, and so I'll start by talking a little bit about my work. Uh, so I work as an engineer on the data team at Compass. Compass is a real estate technology platform basically bringing together the real estate agent with engineers who are building technology to empower them. Uh, and what I specifically work on is bringing in listing data from a bunch of different geographies and then we transform it, we perform a lot of conversions and normalization and so we use a lot of common tools you might see uh, in data pipelines and data processing so this includes Spark, Kafka, Airflow um, but I also like to keep my ear to the ground in terms of what's going on in the industry around this tooling and you know you start to read some interesting things this is Rapids AI, which is partnered with NVIDIA, and their concept is that the GPUs might be start, uh, start to be used for this entire data processing workflow and not just for, say, model training, which is a place where they've started to be used. So you might actually be able to do your pre-processing, even visualization, using the power of GPUs. So this is something that's in development. We might have GPU databases. This is just from this year. Uber uh, built kind of a GPU-powered uh, database for doing analytics. So even in terms of what I work on professionally, uh, there's a couple kind of advancements that might be, uh, you know, putting GPUs into use for these kinds of data processing workflows. Uh, but it also relates to my hobbies, which include deep learning. Um, so I kind of got hooked in it through the Fast AI deep learning course. Uh, I started doing some competitions on Kaggle. Um, and this, this is kind of what got me hooked into thinking about these hardware questions. So this is my computer at home uh, that I put together. Uh, basically after leaving a GPU running on AWS for one weekend, you get a pretty big bill and you're like, okay, maybe I should start to think about building one myself. Um, maybe some people have been there before. Uh, and so this is kind of what got me thinking about uh, GPUs and, and CUDA on kind of a more general level, not just related to deep learning and specifically uh, you know I made a uh, small pull request to PyTorch last year and that's kind of what inspired this talk was um, this was moving one function basically from their Python into the C++ implementation but just seeing kind of how that library was all put together and how they were able to kind of merge uh, you know a Python API with C++ and also CUDA programming uh, it was really fascinating to me and so I wanted to kind of dive in and learn more. So that was part of the origin of this talk. So finally I get to the question that everybody probably wanted to know, uh, which is how can you start programming on the GPU? Uh, and so for an example, um, I've started out with NumPy. So this, is, this would run on the CPU. Uh, and those of you who are familiar kind of with NumPy might see we're taking a random uh, basic vector of 10 million numbers. We're taking two of them and just adding them together, right? And so this is something that you know you could run uh, and NumPy is pretty good at this. Like when I benchmarked it, it wasn't too long. So let's see what would the code look like, the equivalent of this on the GPU. And well, <laughs> that's not much change, right? I'll go back to the other slide and, and there's the, the other slide. And you're like, whoa. Um, so this is from a library called uh, QPy basically and it tries to mirror the NumPy API and it lets you start to take advantage of GPU processing uh, in a pretty straightforward way. Like I said, just one more time, here's, here's NumPy, QPy. Um, but when you benchmark it, you can see that actually just that switch gives you a 30 times speed up. Um, and that's accounting for things like, uh, you know, the GPU executes asynchronously, but you want to make sure you synchronize it. Um, so you're, you're seeing about a 30 times speed up, again, just from this change. Uh, and so that's, that's part of why I think this is so cool, because I think 
you know, how many people out there use NumPy for, for some things, right? You know, it's a, it's a pretty common tool in Python, and so, you know, if there's this drop-in replacement that would let you get these kinds of speed-ups, like, that might really help your workflow. Uh, and so that brings me into talking about kind of the, the outline of this talk. And I'm going to talk about different approaches to doing CUDA programming from your Python application. One, which I just showed you, is as a drop-in replacement. Uh, two is basically taking CUDA strings and compiling them in a, in a Python program. And then the third one, which is kind of the most complex, is actually building it as a C, C++ extension to Python, which with Python allows you to do. Um, and you know, as with a lot of things, I think, in programming, software development, these are kind of in increasing levels of complexity. But what comes along with that complexity and kind of initial setup is it gives you additional flexibility. It might unlock features of the CUDA platform that aren't necessarily available in, say, a drop-in replacement, but that you might be able to access by kind of rolling your own. Um, so to talk about drop-in replacement, the library I showed was, like I said, QPy, which is built as a drop-in replacement. It was originally developed for a deep learning framework called Chainer. Um, it supports a lot of NumPy features, some of which are, are pretty you know, complex, like the whole indexing system, I'm pretty sure they have it working just like NumPy, and NumPy does a lot of crazy things with that. Um, supports a bunch of different data types, broadcasting. Um, there are a couple gotchas, so those of you who raise your hands who might want to think about dropping this into your program, these are things to watch out for. Um, so it can't use data types that are strings or objects. Um, this makes sense if you think about the kind of diagram I showed you that there's a ton of arithmetic units on the GPU, so they're going to be working on numbers, but maybe not so good for these other kinds of data. Um, the other thing is array creation. So in NumPy, you can do numpy.array over a list. It'll turn it into it for you. You can't do that. Uh, and then the last one, which really might trip you up, is if you sum a NumPy array, it's going to return a scalar, uh, it's just one value. But in QPy, it returns a zero-dimensional uh, array, which is uh, going to be a little bit different. If, so it, that is to say that these libraries are good. And I would definitely encourage you to try them out, but definitely keep in mind uh, that there are certain things that might trip you up. It's not quite going to be a total drop and replacement. Uh, so the second uh, way to do it, like I said, uh, is that you can compile CUDA strings in your Python application. And so before we talk about that, then we have to talk about the CUDA API, because compared to the drop in, you're going to actually have to write some CUDA code. Uh, and so this is a diagram of the basic kind of building blocks of how CUDA programming is done. So on the top, you've got a grid, you've got blocks inside that, and then you've got threads inside your blocks. So to break it down a little bit, threads are the things that actually execute CUDA kernels, um, and they have a thread index. And what that's used for is basically to specify which part of the data that thread is meant to work on. Uh, and so this is from the body of a particular CUDA function, but you can see here, if you're executing over a two-dimensional matrix, um, you can basically have a thread index in the X and Y axes, and that lets you specify, like, this thread is meant to take this element of the matrix and add it together. Uh, and you can imagine that this kind of simplifies the logic if you've got a thousand threads um, and I guess if you've ever tried to write some like parallel code, like there's kind of a lot of housekeeping that goes around, like keeping track of these thread indexes and which thread touches which part of the matrix. And a lot of that is built into this CUDA paradigm for you. Um, so then blocks. Blocks is the next level up. Block is a group of threads. Uh, and the important thing is the blocks are required to be able to execute independently but threads within a block can share data. There's kind of block level shared memory. And so if you do need to do some synchronization between your threads, that is possible on the block level. And just like the threads, the block also has dimensions and indexing. Uh, so you can do block index as well as the size of the block. And this is if you need to do kind of more complex computations of like what specific bit of this matrix is, is this thread supposed to operate on. Grids is nothing too fancy, it's a group of blocks. Um, so going back to the diagram then, we kind of are, have these different levels and layers of, 
being able to achieve parallelism. So uh, from the lowest to the top, we've got threads, which are executing the CUDA code, organized into these blocks, which again can also be ar arranged in this two-dimensional or three-dimensional space. And so you see like the zero, zero there is the index. So that block is indexed at zero, zero, and then one, zero. So the grid itself is also a two-dimensional uh, group of blocks. So that's kind of threads, blocks, and grids. Um, so the other kind of piece of it when you get around to actually executing CUDA code is kernels. And that's basically C or C++ code that they've added a bit of extra syntax to. So specifically there's this uh, global kind of identifier that use, you're used to specify your kernel function. And then there's this uh, angle bracket syntax that lets you specify the grid size and the block size. So if you go back to here, obviously this is a parameter that you have control over. So you can say how many blocks go in my grid and then how many threads go in my block. And that's kind of one way to tune the performance. And so by using this syntax, um, you can kind of play around with that and see, well, what's going to be the most effective. Um, so this is one example of what a kernel might look like. So this global identifier at the top here is saying this is the kernel. So this is what's going to execute on the GPU, whereas this main function is what executes on the CPU. And that's kind of the relationship in a CUDA program is you have your host, which is the CPU, you have your device, which is the term for the GPU. And basically your program starts executing on a CPU. And then as soon as it gets to one of these kernels that's going to be executed on device, it basically calls that and communicates and does data transfer across from the CPU to the GPU to be able to run this. And you can see here that at the top, the kernel is making use of these kind of terms I was talking about. So block index, block dimension, thread index to figure out, in this case, it's adding to uh, two dimensional matrices, like figure out which piece of it the thread is actually meant to do work on. Um, so that's kind of, the high level overview of the CUDA API. Um, so when we get to PyCUDA, um, basically this was built uh, by a researcher. Uh, it's used for a lot of scientific and research projects. There's even a research paper about this library, which is not necessarily something you see for all the code you find in GitHub. I was a little bit surprised. Um, so what does it do? Basically, this is example code that kind of gets to the main thing that it gives to you as a programmer, which is you can take the, the CUDA kernel code. So if we, if we go back here, this is what a kernel looks like. And this global function is what's going to execute on the device. So it's what's going to execute on the GPU. You can basically pull that out uh, and within your Python program, supply that as a string to this source module object. And then there's an additional, uh, this get function call. And this basically compiles it as a GPU kernel and then pulls it into your Python program to allow you to be able to call it uh, over your objects. Um, so this is one way that lets you start to write CUDA code, but you don't have to step out of like a Python environment because um, all the objects and, and whatnot are still going to be just like, uh, like in a Python program. Uh, and so this is one of the nice things is uh, in PyCUDA you get automatic memory management. Uh, so basically once something goes out of scope or once you delete something, it's actually going to free the allocated memory on the GPU. And when I get to describing like C extensions and kind of the most manual way to do it, you'll see that that can actually save you a lot of hassle. Um, these are other kind of classes it provides. So it's an in, out, and in, out classes to describe your uh, arrays or matrices, and these handle memory transfer between the CPU and GPU. Um, basically, there's a lot of steps you'd have to do in order to perform. If, let's say you have a NumPy array on your CPU. You want to like double all the elements. These are all the steps you'd have to do to be able to accomplish that, and there's a lot of them in terms of creating memory, moving data across, and so PyCUDA also has certain higher level abstractions where basically in means this array is meant to go to the GPU and it handles that for you. And in out is even a little bit more complicated. We're just saying this NumPy array, say, is meant to go into the GPU, be processed in your CUDA kernel, and then come back out. Uh, and as long as you're okay with that happening automatically, PyCUDA can handle that behind the scenes. And the last thing, which I think is really useful, is automatic error checking. So because CUDA 
is some of the operations execute asynchronously, uh, and so collecting and surfacing the errors can be really challenging. And including this, this is from the documentation, if an asynchronous error occurs, it will be reported by some subsequent unrelated runtime function call. And that, that sounded pretty confusing to me. It's like, okay, well, if an error happens in one thing, basically the next function you call is going to error. Uh, and so PyCUDA also handles that for you and raises them as kind of specific Python exceptions in the paradigm you might be more familiar with. And finally, another interesting bit is you can do metaprogramming. So basically, when I was talking about threads, blocks, grids, um, basically, you have to tune those parameters, like how many threads in a block, how many blocks in a grid. Um, just, I mean, just like you might do with parallel programming on a CPU. Uh, and it's often done with heuristics, but PyCUDA basically says, forget heuristics, we can do this by running things, and we can empir empirically determine how to actually set these parameters. So this is one example. Uh, which is actually using Jinja templating. So, uh, like I said, because the module is a string in Python, it kind of like follows that any way you can create a Python string, you can pass and compile it. Uh, so this is kind of a clever, kind of crazy way of doing it, but you can basically pass in different parameters in terms of types. So you can see it's parameterizing over uh, the float type. It's, you can pass in a different block size, a different thread block size. Uh, and it basically, so first templates your string and then kind of just in time compiles it into a CUDA kernel. So, I mean, that's really cool because, you know, it, especially as you're trying to play around with this and like, uh, you know, this week I was trying to compile different things and see how they ran, but uh, this step would be, would be a lot faster just to be able to basically loop through different configurations in Python uh, and be able to see the results empirically. Okay, so then the last bit, which, like I said, is the most manual, but it might give you the most flexibility, is CUDA as a C extension. Uh, and so first, let's talk about Python C extensions. So Python, but because the, you know, the interpreter is C-based, you can extend it uh, with C and C++ programs. Uh, you can add new modules of your own design. Uh, and that's used in even a lot of programs that want to achieve a better performance on the CPU. So, for example, NumPy, uh, NumPy links into certain CPU system, or yeah, C system calls rather, to be able to achieve the kind of performance it does. Uh, so, this is already a paradigm being used in kind of high performance computing settings. And so the question is, okay, so I know I can get my C or C++ program into Python as an extension. So then how do I get my CUDA program to a C or a C++? Uh, and basically, CUDA, well, there, there's different forms of it, but what I've been talking about is referred to as CUDA C. And so this is basically C, uh, but with a special syntax. And so NVIDIA provides you with this NVCC compiler which basically takes your CUDA C source code and it does a couple things. Um, one, it turns the kernel into like assembly or binary for operations on the GPU. It takes one of these special syntaxes and replaces it with uh, runtime calls. And then finally, you can also have it just compile the host like CPU code. Uh, and so NVCC can do all of it uh, like itself. So there's just one compilation step that basically generates output in CUDA as well as the code you would need to run on the CPU to launch the kernel. Uh, and so on the Python side, uh, it can get very complex. This is a very good GitHub repo. It cheats a little bit and uses Cython, um, but there's a couple options you can use when you're kind of going between C++ and Python. So Cython is one of them. Swig is another one that's also, there's an example in this repo. Um, so Basically, once you find some way of creating your extension, then you need to use setup tools to compile it and link it together. And this code is also from that repository. Um, basically, in setup tools, in your uh, basically setup.py, you create an extension. You can specify the sources as well as how to compile it. And so you can see here um, that we're using the CUDA libraries and you can see NVCC as well as GCC to basically compile all this together and package it up and then that will uh, basically link into our Python program 
Um, but I would encourage you, to, this part gets very complex. If you're interested in this, I would encourage you to check out that code um, because those people put together some very complex tricks to actually be able to get all this to come together. Um, so why would you want to do that? I just said like it's really complex. Um, one is manual memory management, which you might see as a downside. You're like, we're using Python. Why do I want to manage my own memory? Uh, and this is kind of the constructor of that GPU adder class. Um, you see mallocs. You're like, whoa. Um, but, and here's, here's a destructor, uh, so you have to call free. And heaven forbid you don't. Uh, uh, but basically, why would you want this? But I think there is a benefit because there's certain manual mem memory management features in CUDA. So some advanced things. Um, mapped memory, I think, is the most interesting, which is basically like you can map memory between your host, which is CPU again, and device, and basically be able to access it um, without having to do an explicit data transfer. Uh, and so that can be pretty cool. But basically, there's a couple features that m might only be accessible if, once you get down to the level of, of doing this kind of stuff. The other thing is, and I know this might be heresy because it's a Python conference, but you do get a compiler. Uh, and I will say the nice thing about that is like you're, you're writing in a language that's unfamiliar to you, right? I, you know, at least for me, like I don't do a ton of CUDA programming. Even when I use it, I'm mostly using Python. And so being able to have the compiler tell you this went wrong on these lines, I would say when I was working on tweaking this C extension stuff, uh, I actually felt kind of grateful for the compiler. So that, that can be kind of nice. Um, so to conclude, one, I want to talk a little bit about accessing a GPU. So you might be interested in, in playing around with some of this stuff yourself. One, Google Colab is like really awesome. It's a browser-based notebook interface and it's free, and it gives you access to a GPU. Uh, and so some of the more custom stuff, I don't think you'll be able to like link extensions on it, but you can definitely download QPy and play around with that. And you know, PyCuda you should also be able to install, and so that's free. And then even like cloud GPU instances are starting to become accessible. So on AWS, you can get it for less than a dollar an hour if you just want to spend, you know, two or three or four hours playing around with that, or Google Cloud. Um, their pricing is a little bit different. This is per GPU. I think you also need an instance to attach it to, but it still should be under a dollar an hour uh, if, if this stuff kind of interests you and you, uh, you want to play around with it. So then the last question I want to talk about is, is where do you go next? So you kind of have gone through this uh, talk. I've submitted you to this talk. Uh, and what can you do with it? So one, I would say you could start to think about how you can apply CUDA and GPU programming to your workflow. Like I said, that's like a really active area of development. Um, a lot of things coming out. And so especially if you have your work has anything to do with data pipelines, processing, or obviously machine learning and deep learning, but that's already, kind of already been done. Um, so that's something to start thinking about. The other thing is, you know, now you have access to like 4,000 cores, what do you do with it? So you can start learning a little bit more about parallel programming algorithms, how to make use of that like most effectively, um, because you can do cooler things with it than just like adding 10 million numbers uh, to each other. And then the other thing is if, if this stuff kind of excites you, there's also a bunch of other kinds of devices to start thinking about. So people talk about the XPU, concept. So Google has TPUs, which are specifically for deep learning. People are starting to come up with all sorts of devices. And then you can kind of go a different direction too and start doing FPGA, which basically is building hardware to execute like certain algorithms. Um, so you know, there's a, there's a whole device side of it too and kind of getting beyond the CPU paradigm and figuring out, well, can I come up with a specialized device that's better than this kind of one single general smart thing? Um, so that's, that's what I would suggest if, if you found this to be interesting. Thank you so much. There's my Twitter. I'll probably post, I'll definitely post the slides and related code uh, on there. So if you have any more questions. Thank you so much.